Earlier today, I was talking with one of my banjo students about small mountain towns that sit just off the Turnpike and the Lincoln Highway along Pennsylvania's southern tier. Along that rural area between the Somerset area and Chambersburg. My student who graduated high school in the early mid-1960s had a friend in college who lived just east of Bedford, home of the Bedford Banjo Shop, coincidentally. Late spring, or maybe early in the summer, he said, there was a big kidnapping that drew a lot of media attention in the area. He tried to remember the name of the town, and through talking it out, we realized he was referring to burnt cabins. Now, I've heard of burnt cabins before. In fact, I've driven through the historical area. As I recall, there was a settlement of some sort in the early days of the province of Pennsylvania, as it was called at the time. Anyhow, there was a land dispute with one of the local Indian tribes who protested that the English colonists in the small village represented a trespass into their land. The Pennsylvania powers agreed and ordered the villagers to relocate. Some were arrested when they resisted and their cabins now vacated were raised. The area would become known henceforth as Burnt Cabin. There's a grist mill there. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't really remember much else of the town though. For a little while, my student hashed out details of the kidnapping as best he could. What he could remember was there was like a mountain man, some sort of hermit, and he stole a young lady into the woods where he held her captive for a week or so. And the FBI and the media, they all soon followed after. And there was a shootout and things ended badly for an officer and more predictably for this mountain man. The story sounded vaguely familiar to me, but I wasn't so sure I needed to do some digging. The following events occurred in May 1966. This is the story of Bicycle Pete and the kidnapping and rescue of Peggy Ann Bradnick. Shade Gap is a small town by just about any standard. These days it has about 100 residents which rivals the nearest towns of Burt Cabins and Fort Littleton whose exit on the turnpike hasn't done much to stimulate growth in Fort Littleton. To my understanding, not much has changed in the region over the decades. In 1960, about 40 more people lived in the town than do today. By 1962, random violent acts began happening in Shade Gap and the surrounding countryside. The locals lived in nightly apprehension of a sniper who had been shooting at automobiles and houses. A lot of suspects, but none of them rarely credible. The mysterious sniper was therefore dubbed the Mountain Man. A woman was nearly killed when bullets were shot into her home. Another woman was nearly abducted but was able to fight off the would-be kidnapper and run to safety. Early in 1965, a woman stopped her car to make shift roadblock of branches and logs laid across the road. From the densely wooded hillside, a rifle sounded and several shots hit her car, narrowly missing an infant who sat inside. There were other victims of the mountain man. In two incidents, bullets met their targets. One woman was shot in the hand and, on Good Friday 1965, a landowner found a man trespassing in his garden. Some sources say the man was peering in the house at his wife. Ned Price surprised the mountain man was shot in the leg. That leg would eventually have to be amputated. Another woman went to answer her front door one night only to be shot in the hand. Even more bizarre, her assailant bandaged her wound before fleeing back into the hills. Despite these close encounters, nobody was able to identify the mountain man. Each described him as wearing a mask and black knee-high boots and an old army coat. Also around 1962, a man named 
William Hollenbaugh moved into a rented two-room cabin off Route 522. Born around 1921, he had grown up in the Junietta County region. Hollenbaugh had a rough life by all accounts, and by the age of 18, he was sent to the famed Western Penitentiary, having been convicted of burglary in Perry County. He would be transferred to Rockview Prison in Center County just outside of State College. From Rockview, he would escape in 1941 and was captured about nine months later in the Commonwealth of Virginia and returned to Pennsylvania. Due to growing concerns with Hollenbaugh's mental stability, he was moved to the Fairville Mental Hospital for the criminally insane, as it was known at the time. That occurred around 1944. William Hollenbaugh was released from Fairview uh, Mental Hospital in Wayne County in 1959. Excluding those nine months following his escape from Rockview, he had spent the last 20 years of his life inside institutions. Anyhow, Hollenbaugh moved into the cabin around 1962. Locals described him as being a loner who seemed to care more for his dogs than any person. He lived off a $35 monthly state relief check, according to a local store owner who was quoted in the May 18, 1966 edition of the Pittsburgh Press newspaper, quote, He was rather conservative in his shopping. He always bought food for his dog and roll your own cigarettes, end quote. Others state that Hollenbaugh made extra money as a hired hand of sorts. His history was likely unknown to most folks in the Shade Gap region. Being as solitary as he was, most folks seemed to know him as Bicycle Bill or Bicycle Pete. Occasionally, he would ride his red bicycle with one of his dogs in a basket strapped to the handlebars nearly 20 miles to Mount Union. Mount Union being the closest town with a supermarket. Following the Good Friday shooting of Ned Price in 1965, the Mountain Man attacks stopped. That doesn't mean the authorities had given up in their search of the sniper. In fact, Hollenbaugh had been suspected at one point in his cabin may have been searched, but nothing came of it. The state police, based out of Hollidaysburg in nearby Blair County, had considered some 500 suspects. Suffice to say, there wasn't much to go on. Some suspected that the sniper had moved on, while others in law enforcement didn't think he'd leave a region he was so comfortable with. And in hindsight, the sniper may have just been preparing. On May 11, 1966, the silence was broken. The six Bragnick siblings were returning from school at Southern Huntington County High School. The bus dropped them off aside a dirt road which led to their isolated home. Along their walk down the road, a masked man, armed with a lever-action rifle, stepped from the dense force. He was quoted as saying, I don't want any sass from you kids. I'm taking the girl with me. At this, he grabbed 17-year-old Peggy Ann Bradnick and stole her into the woods. James, Peggy Ann's oldest brother, 16 at the time, had ran the last quarter mile to the family home where he found his father preparing dinner. Mr. Bradnick and James armed themselves and attempted to find Peggy Ann, then contacted the authorities. Unknown to the Bradnicks at the time was that... Once the other children were all out of view, Hollenbaugh took Peggy Ann across the lane again and into the forest on the other side of the street in order to confuse any would-be pursuer. Already suspecting the elusive sniper who had attempted an abduction at least once before, the kidnapping would set into motion the largest manhunt in United States history at that time. To the best of my knowledge, it wouldn't be until the D.B. Cooper skyjacking incident that a larger manhunt would be conducted. The five remaining Bragnick siblings gave statements to the authorities. There was the 16-year-old James we had mentioned, 11-year-old Mary, 9-year-old twins Dawn and Deborah, and 8-year-old Carol. 
They each described a man with a gruff voice and guessed he was in his 30s. He wore dark glasses and had the same style of boots which had been noted by sniper witnesses. As early as May 12th, the news was already reporting that the kidnapper was likely to be the sniper. Within hours, a posse of more than 200 men had been mustered and were searching through the mountain forest around Shade Gap. Bloodhounds were brought in and even helicopters were in the sky, eyes scanning the ground. Early on, efforts were focused on an area known as Dry Run Hollow near Neelyton. It was here that a lady's slip had been found about three miles southeast from the point on the lane where Peggy Ann had been kidnapped. Authorities weren't sure if it was Peggy Ann's slip, but it was the best lead they had. Many were concerned that the kidnapper had driven off with her as the Bloodhound's trail continued to end by the side of a paved road a couple of miles through the rocky woods from the Bradnick home. Dense fog and heavy rain slowed the search overnight. By the third day, May 12th, the posse had grown just shy of 500 people, scouring a 25 square mile area surrounding Shade Gap. Authorities involved in the manhunt included the Pennsylvania State Police, FBI agents from Harrisburg, and game officers due to their knowledge of the terrain. Local police and citizens made up the bulk of the manhunt. They renewed their efforts by 7 that morning, with hundreds breaking up into groups of 15 or so, each with a radio contact with the state police who had a command near Tuscarora Mountain. The Huntington State Police Barracks spokesman was quoted in the Reading Eagle of Friday the 13th, stated that efforts were being focused on the region between Tuscarora and Shade Mountains, but that a 13th state bulletin had gone out. At this point, nobody was reporting that the kidnapper, assumed to also be the sniper, was William Hollenbaugh. By Saturday the 14th, the posse was over 600 strong, with additional people volunteering their weekend. The help was appreciated as some of the officers had been working more than 24 hours. Crowds of curious onlookers had started arriving as well, and State Police Lieutenant Edward Milternowski expressed frustration with the outlookers as their presence was beginning to hamper search efforts and valuable personnel were having to deal with the crowd control, taking them away from the crucial search. A Maryland native had been taken into custody when he was found in the woods and not a member of a search party. He was released when none of the Bradnick siblings were able to identify him. Eugene Bradnick, Peggy Ann's father, expressed concern that his daughter was either out of the region or was bound, likely in an old cabin in the forest. He surmised that Peggy Ann knew the woods well, certainly well enough to find her way home. With the hunt going into its fourth day, many were fearing the worst. Still, the search force grew nearly 2,000 strong. A couple of highly trained tracking dogs were being flown in from out west as they had been crucial factors in the apprehension of a fugitive in the state of Arizona. When Peggy Ann had been taken into the woods by her abductor, he led her to a clearing where he took off his dark glasses and pulled out a man's jacket and trousers, ordering her to put them on in order to better conceal her identity. With his mask and glasses off, Peggy Ann recognized her captor as the Bicycle Man. According to Peggy Ann, Hollabaugh claimed to have been watching her for the past couple of years. In the near distance, she could hear her father calling for her, shouting her name and searching the woods. Hollenbaugh threatened Peggy Ann to stay quiet, telling her she should consider herself dead. He led her through a tunnel which ran south underneath the turnpike. Later, he bound Peggy Ann to a tree in the region outside the immediate search parameter in order to tend to or possibly retrieve his dogs from his cabin along Route 522. Later, they would cross under the turnpike, hiding in numerous caves which dot the hillsides. In these caves, Hollenbaugh had stored canned food, mostly beans and corn, which he shared with Peggy Ann. They would eventually remain in the area of Gobbler's Knob, a region just north of the Fulton County Maintenance Office, and with the little Ogwick Creek wrapping around it. Peggy Ann stated that Hollenbaugh didn't speak much, typically communicating in little grunts, 
but that he told her that he was the sniper. He also had a plan to hijack a car near Fort Littleton Turnpike exit. There they would drive to Mifflinton, Mifflin Town, sorry, in Junietta County, where they would live together. Hollenbub made it clear he had no intentions of returning her to her family. In later years, Peggy Ann stated that he would threaten to kill her if she left, and would point his gun at her or press a knife against her, fearing for her life as she did. Sometimes, the search groups, she said, would be so close that she could see them and even hear them lighting their cigarettes. On May 15th, the tracker dogs which had arrived from the west had picked up on Hollenbaugh and Peggy Ann's scent in the area of one of the caves where they had been hidden. The authorities, who had been operating at this point under the auspices that Peggy Ann was likely dead, began to think there was a good chance that she may still be alive. By May 16th, FBI agents from Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Philadelphia had joined in on the search. Sometime on the 16th, Hollenbaugh, with Peggy Ann in tow, burglarized the house, inside of which Hollenbaugh found a 32 pistol. By this time, the authorities began to suspect Hollenbaugh anew. The familiar sight of him riding his red bicycle through the area ceased on the same day Peggy Ann was abducted, and that hadn't gone unnoticed. What's more, there was an unofficial report that Peggy Ann was being held in Hollenbaugh's cabin according to later reporting in the Daily Collegian paper of State College. The following morning, Tuesday, May 17th, a search group was in the vicinity of Hollenbaugh's cabin. Led by the tracking dogs, they witnessed one of Hollenbaugh's dogs scratching at the door of the cabin trying to get in. FBI agent Terry Ray Anderson led the group to the door of the cabin when, from the forest, Shots were fired, killing Anderson and one of the dogs at the scene. The other tracking dog was shot and would die shortly afterward. Peggy Ann and Hollenbaugh were spotted in the distance, but the group were unable to apprehend them. Terry Ray Anderson, 42, was a father. He was also only the ninth FBI agent killed in the line of duty, and there is a memorial to him now in the region where all this occurred. With the murder of an FBI agent and two highly valuable dogs, the manhunt would become the largest in US history at that time, which I'd mentioned before. By mid-morning of May 17th, reports were going out over state police radios that all available officers were to muster at Shea Gap as soon as possible and come armed with machine guns. Hollenbaugh's picture was being distributed and the posse swelled to over 1,000. Even the National Guard was involved by this point. With the increased and intensified search, Hollenbaugh was unable to cross the turnpike as he had been doing. Unable to leave the ever-shrinking search area, Hollenbaugh and Peggy Ann continued to move through the night coming across a cabin with a separate outbuilding for the shower and toilet in the wee hours of the morning. The cabin was occupied by Deputy Sheriff Francis Sharp of Johnstown of Cambria County. He had come down to assist in the search and in the early morning he walked to the cabin's outhouse where he saw Hollenbaugh standing in the shower stall. Sharp was shot in the stomach by Hollenbaugh and directed to the car. Hollenbaugh shoved Peggy Ann into the back seat and ordered Sharp to drive to Route 522 in a last-ditch effort to escape the authorities. In order to get to 522 from the cabin, the critically injured Sharp had to drive down a farmer's road. Where the farmer's road met 522 about a quarter mile away, there was a gate. And when they encountered that gate, Hollenbaugh ordered Sharp to get out and open it. According to the Gettysburg Times of May 18th, the article on the following events, a state trooper approached the gate from the side of the highway. When Sharp arrived at the gate, the officer asked him who the other people in the car were. Hollenbaugh shot again, and Peggy Ann ran from the car towards the nearby Rubeck family barn, waving her hands to signal a helicopter flying nearby. Sharp ran across 522 to the Rubeck's house. 
The Rubex neighbor, Harper Klein, watched as Hollenbaugh ran to a cusp of pines near Rubex's house. Sharp, grasping at his bleeding stomach, pointed toward the pines, and several shots were fired, including one from 15-year-old David Rubeck, who had fired a slug from a 12-gauge shotgun from inside of his home. A state trooper was also firing at Hollenbaugh from the corner of the barn where Peggy Ann had fled. Hollenbaugh, according to Governor Scranton's press secretary, fired two rounds from the 38, but was shot in the chest and in the neck and collapsed. For some time, it was believed that David Rubeck had fired the fatal shot into Hollenbaugh's neck, but this has come under debate in the months following the shootout. David Klein, the neighbor, was quoted as saying that the entry wound in Hollenbaugh's neck was roughly the size of a silver dollar and unlikely to be made by the trooper's pistol. Regardless, Hollenbaugh died at the scene. He was taken to Fulton County Medical Center in McConnellsburg just the same. His corpse was actually handcuffed to the gurney. He was only 44 years old and his body would be taken to a funeral home in Mifflintown, Junietta County. Due to the volume of curiosity seekers, some driving in from as far away as Maryland, the funeral home posted a sign saying that the mountain man was no longer there. His brother would not accept the body and his grave is unmarked. Peggy Ann was also taken to the Fulton County Medical Center, albeit in a different vehicle and Deputy Sharp was rushed to the hospital in Chambersburg, where he had a surgery. In the following days, the reporting of the story varied. Even basic facts from the shootout have become difficult to ascertain. Some state that Hollenbaugh was shot near the porch of the Rubeck house. Others state that he was near a corn crib. More interesting, though, was the reporting from the Fulton County coroner, Russell McLucas, who described one bullet hole in Hollenbaugh's body and that it went through the neck and out near the shoulder. Based on the size of the entry wound, it was the coroner's professional opinion that the gun could not have been the 12 gauge or a 16 gauge depending on your source which Rubeck had fired. McLucas concluded that the fatal blow must have been fired from one of the state troopers who possessed a higher caliber. Nobody though denied that Larry Rubeck and David Rubeck had fired on Hollenbaugh. Over the following weekend, Peggy Ann Bradnick gave a 10-minute press conference from a room in the McConnellsburg Medical Center. She thanked everyone who had participated in her rescue. When her father had been asked about Hollenbaugh on the 18th, Eugene Bradnick had stated that the family was familiar with him and knew him as the bicycle man, but that they'd never really spoken to him. He did not know why Hollenbaugh would have kidnapped his daughter. During the press conference, Peggy Ann revealed her belief that William Hollenbaugh had become infatuated by her for some reason or another. She stated to her physician that she had put off Hollenbaugh's sexual advances, but on sex, Hollenbaugh had told her, quote, One of these days you are going to want to know about it if you don't already. End quote. Despite all this, Peggy Ann's doctors reported that she had not been sexually assaulted. She was bruised and blistered. At the time of the press conference, Peggy Ann said that the bruising was all from the trials of being led by a chain through the demanding wilderness. She was adamant that she was never physically harmed and that Hollenbaugh was as nice to her as the situation allowed, but did use fear and the threat of violence in order to manipulate her. She had lost 14 pounds over the course of the week. In more recent years, Peggy Ann, now a grandmother, has shared her story publicly. According to her, Hollenbaugh had beaten her one day, um, either when she would not eat canned peas or when she did not show gratitude for his having killed a man for her. But this is not Peggy Ann being bitter and reflecting on the situation negatively. According to Peggy Ann, the adult, the fear of the situation sent all common sense out the window. And she was likely in shock for days and 
went a number of years without speaking much about the events and certainly not to roomfuls of people. In more recent times though, she's been recounting her abduction now more than 50 years past to local groups, including prisoners. Years of reflection, she has a degree of sympathy for Hollenbaugh. More recent quotes find her saying that she has forgiven the man who abducted her and held her in bondage for a week in the spring of 1966. Movies and books and even a song have been made about Peggy Ann's kidnapping at the hands of the mountain man whose red bicycle is actually at the Pennsylvania State Police Museum. But Peggy Ann herself is out to set the record straight. One of the first things Peggy Ann wants people to know is that she is not a victim forever looking behind her. She's a survivor and she is always looking forward.